All right, well, we're here to talk about the uh, cybersecurity, protecting your company in the digital economy. <laughs> For everybody to sit down. Uh, I'm Tracy Morris. I'm the CEO of McLean Intelligence Solutions. We're an IT uh, solutions provider. We're located here in Temple, not too far away from, from this spot. Um, uh, we want to thank everybody for, for coming out today. Uh, we have a topic that is in the headlines um, constantly. Uh, so we've got a lot of folks here that I'm sure are very aware of cybersecurity, but I'm not so sure that everybody knows what cybersecurity is. So cybersecurity covers computer security, information security, digital security, um, as well as network and cloud security. We could go on anything that has to do with your phone, your computer, uh, any digital or, or electronics that you use, um, even Alexa, so you can get in through Alexa these days. Um, so anyway, but it affects both our, our personal as well as our, our business security. Um, a few statistics uh, about cybersecurity is 43% of cyber attacks are targeted at small and medium-sized businesses. It's just easy. 95% of cybersecurity breaches are attributed to human error, compromised credentials, passwords, so forth. It's really easy to get into your stuff. 47% of businesses that have less than 50 employees allocate no funds towards cybersecurity. Um, a staggering 42% of companies are experiencing cyber fatigue and a sense of apathy towards proactively defending their companies. So they've pretty much given up before they started. Um, and approximately 20% of small businesses have implemented multi-factor authentication <coughs> I'm sorry, in order to further increase security. And I know if you're a McLean Intelligence Solution customer, you know about multi-factor authentication. So um, hopefully many of you do know about it as well. Um, we have a distinguished panel of folks here to help you understand the topic in greater detail. They'll take any questions that you have along the way, so feel free to raise your hand. I'm going to ask each one of them to uh, introduce themselves. So we have Jer Jeremy Wilson from the Texas Department of Information Resources. He's the Deputy CISO, uh, Texas Cybersecurity Coordinator. Uh, Dr. Jean Baptiste Coffey from the University of Mary Hardin Baylor. He's an assistant professor in business computer information systems. And John Hawking, Centex Technologies Chief Technology Officer. So, Jeremy, if you'll begin, introduce yourself. Yeah, um, is this on? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tracy, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be on the panel. Um, as you said, I'm the Deputy Chief Information Security Officer for the Department of Information Resources. Um, I'm filling in for Tony Sauerhoff, who is our Texas Cybersecurity Coordinator, but that's okay. I'm a, another one of our Deputy CISOs. Um, I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with DIR. Is there, is there anyone, could you raise your hand if you've heard of the Department of Information Resources? Okay, that's good. Um, so yeah, I've been at DIR for about nine years. Um, I originally started as the Security Operations Center Security Manager uh, in 2014, so I worked there for a while before coming into this role. Um, been in IT and cybersecurity for about 20 years. Um, most of my experience comes from DOD. Um, I was in active duty in the Texas Army National Guard and ran the security program at Camp Mabry and had various other DOD positions over the years. So I'm excited to be on the panel and uh, you know talk about this interesting uh, topic with you guys. Okay, I'm Jean Baptiste Coffey, um, Assistant Professor in uh, Information System from the College of Business uh, at the University of Mary Hard in Baylor. Um, I'm teaching a lot of courses. Um, right now, uh, I'm in charge of our concentration uh, in uh, at the managerial part in information information security. And I'm also, I've been teaching also database analysis and design, um, cyber security, a little bit more technical. Um, and I've been also at the uh, kind of level of uh, multimedia and information technology and teaching all type of courses regarding Adobe products. So that's basically um, what I'm doing right now. Uh, hello, uh, my name is John Hawking. I'm currently the CTO for Syntex Technologies. I've been there 
Uh, roughly about a year uh, going on now at this point. Before then, I was the CTO with Clean ISD, so I was running all of their technology. Um, that's, that was about a 12-year stint. Um, before that, I was running uh, secure operations for Fort Hood Duum. Um, before then, I was lucky enough to be with uh, Drayton at McLean Advanced Technologies for a few years on their teams. Yes, that was great. That was a great experience. Um, and then before then, obviously, it was the United States military, so I was running IT and some other operations in the United States military. Um, so I'm excited to be here. This is a great panel. Uh, we do help a lot of organizations around the town and around the state, uh, including like Workforce and Boys and Girls Club and all of that for their cyber operations. So any questions you guys have, just let us know. We've been doing it a long time. So one of the main questions I guess we'll just start with is why should businesses care about cybersecurity? Why, why, is this, why should this be important to them? Um, in how they run their business. Um, I'm going to let each one of you answer it. If, Jeremy, if you want to start. Yeah, great. Yeah, great question. Um, so, you know, I'm uh, in my role, we're in charge of cybersecurity incident response. We have a newly formed cybersecurity incident response team. And so a lot of times we're talking to customers, they could be cities, uh, counties, school districts, state agencies, when they're having a cybersecurity incident, ransomware, or something of that nature. Um, obviously, you know, you would hope that somebody cares a little bit about cybersecurity before they're impacted, but as you said, with uh, the amount of news stories in the media, I think everyone's aware that we're all doing business online, and so whether, you know, you have a website or you have customer data, credit cards, um, the bad guys are always trying to get in. And um, once you're in an incident, there's some things you can do, but there's a lot of things you can do to prepare yourself before that day, um, because once that happens, um, it, it's it's hard to quantify the reputational loss. Um, if you're doing business with someone and they're like, you know, for example, like, you know, I trust Amazon, right? Like they have a lot of my information. So when I, someone asks me to go sign up to a new website, I'm like, do I want to put my credit card personal information to this company? Do I know them? And, uh, you know, even really big companies like Amazon have breaches. So that's not to say that because you're a big company that you're secure, but that's a thought, I think, in people's minds and consumers' minds. And so doing your best to protect their data with the resources you have, I think, is uh, very important. And uh, right now we are in the information age, as you all know, and as soon as you have internet, you are at risk of uh, getting infected in a certain way or another. And so it's really important, it doesn't matter if, let's say, you are in a, a small company or a big company, it's really important to take uh, cyber security into consideration. Because if, let's say, a hacker gets access to your information, um, you might say, okay, the information is it's an asset now. And so if it's an asset and uh, the hacker gets access to that asset, then it becomes a problem. So what could happen is that your system could be shut down. That's one thing. And if you are a small company, uh, there might be extortion and you will have to pay in order to get your, uh, uh, your information retrieved. Uh, and in that case, you might even uh, lose your reputation if par uh, particularly you're dealing with information from, uh, I mean, I would say really important and precise information from your customers, you know. And uh, then also you can go into uh, bankruptcy in that case also if, let's say, your system is, is shut down or if, let's say, your, uh, your, the information that you have is encrypted. Because what happens here is that sometimes some of the hackers, as soon as they get access to your information, they are going to encrypt it and you can't get access to it unless you pay them. You know? So that's the reason it's really, really, really important to uh, uh, take cyber security into consideration making sure that you you protect your information I'll add a little bit of um, context to that discussion I've been in various organizations where either we or somebody I knew that was close to me was hit by this kind of in this this incident this attack um, it's affected their families, it's affected their small businesses, it's affected um, their day-to-day. -day. I mean, it affected me when I was a CTO at Clean. My identity was stolen in some crazy way, and I'm a cyber guy, so I do what I'm supposed to do, and I still got it affected. Um, and I had to lock down my credit. I had to lock down a lot of things that I normally don't lock down. So I've seen people that have lost their jobs. I've seen people who have 
their kids' identity has been stolen, which kind of affects their families. Um, so I will stress as we go through this process, it will impact you. It's usually, it's like, a, it's like riding a motorcycle. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you're gonna get in an accident. So it's the same thing with cyber. I will tell you that at least 50% of the things that you can do from a business perspective are all free. So as long as you have the people who can advise you or you have people on staff that can help you, the opportunities are there, the expenses are very low, um, but the risks are real. Um, so hopefully today we can shine some light on that. And then if you guys have any questions after that, there's a group of companies here, I think that will help you towards that end. Great, thank you. Um, so Gene, what are two or three recommendations that a small or medium sized business owner could utilize in building their IT plan or should? Uh, Okay, uh, so basically, uh, sir, I'm about to give you a list of multiple acronyms because there are a lot of uh, free information I would say that you could have access to. Um, uh, for example, there is the NISTIR 7621 Revision 1. And this one is from the National Institute of Standards and Technology Internal and Interagency reports. So actually, that report is giving you some um, sort of information about your cybersecurity plan, but uh, it's not at a technical level, I would say. It, it's, it's a good read. It's easier to understand. So this one is something that is really important uh, to know. There is also the NIST SP 800-61. It gives you guidance for incident handling. And that one also you could get access to. And um, another thing also uh, that is really important is people. You know? And uh, it's sometimes we will think about the fact that, okay, uh, we have, um, let's say, uh, the hackers uh, are outside the companies, they are going to get access to our system. But another thing is really that we have to take into consideration is that uh, by being able to train the people in your company is going to be really important and crucial. Uh, so these are some of the recommendations uh, for uh, small business owners, knowing uh, the data that you are collecting, um, the, the value of that data also that you are collecting, and how to protect that data. So that's what I would like to add. John, do you want to take a uh, sure, yeah. Um, a lot of the things that you have to do are pretty simple. Uh, passwords being the one main thing, make sure they're complex. Um, stress to your employees that they don't reuse the passwords in your corporate environment that they use on Chegg.com or Amazon or any of the other accounts. Um, if I'm an attacker and I do a lot of pen testing and, and threat emulation practice, if I can compromise or I can get your account information, if you use your corporate email and your corporate password on Chegg.com or Amazon and I find that, then I'm running automated scripts that will do these things for me while I'm sleeping and see if I can VPN into your organization or access any of your other accounts. So stress to your employees that they don't reuse their passwords. Um, whatever they use in their corporate environment is all they will use. Uh, other things like um, endpoint security, manufacturers, Microsoft, places like those or organizations like those, they'll tell you what you should do, configurations you should put on your devices. They're free. If you own the device, you can configure them the way that Microsoft or Chromebooks or whatever you're doing recommends, right? Another thing that a lot of organizations don't understand that we use a lot, Cisco, Fortinet, all these big companies that provide you with this technology, they're willing to send people down and do evaluations on your equipment for free. If you get a hold of them and you say, hey, I want you to come down and, and evaluate my systems and tell me what I'm supposed to do, they'll do that for free. I mean, if you follow the manufacturer best practices, you do some of the things that, that both of these gentlemen are gonna talk about, and you also bring in free resources to harden up anything else, I think that gets you at least 50% of the way there. Yeah, I was just going to add um, great recommendations for my fellow panelists, uh, but something else to think of that I said, because, you know, kind of my team response to cybersecurity incidents is uh, consider developing an incident response plan. And like I said, you know, I work for DIR, 
you know, we're part of the plan that the state has, you know, that we work with DPS and the Texas Division of Emergency Management that uh, kind of fits in with how we respond to hurricanes. And so it doesn't have to be that hard. Um, I know he mentioned NIST. We have on our website, we have a booth back there. Uh, we have an incident response red book that is kind of meant to help organizations that don't have an incident response plan tailor one. So if you have one, a lot of times we find that it's older or no, or you don't have one. And there's some really basic things that could go into that that can help you out. That, so you're not having to deal with it in the middle of a crisis. And these can involve, you know, knowing who your uh, internet service provider, having their phone number. You know, do they do, they do DDoS? If you have websites at different places, having all those phone numbers. And then across your organization, just kind of socializing the plan on kind of who's on first, who's going to respond in various roles. Uh, so just something to think about, um, you know, kind of getting your team together, your stakeholders, even if it's smaller, and uh, talking through how you respond to a ransomware incident or something of that nature. Yeah, that's a great point. The, the response is, is so critical, and it has to happen quickly. So that's a great point, too. Um, let's see. Let's talk about... Um, touch a little bit about uh, ransomware and how it affects companies and again how to reduce that risk we're going to keep talking about how they reduce that risk right of how they um, can protect themselves but talk a little bit about ransomware and what that is uh, any one of you can you jump in um, yeah I'll, I'll start off um, like I said um, you know Ransomware uh, is rampant. It's affecting everything from small businesses up to federal organizations and, and large um, privately held companies. And so, you know, but there are some things you can do. Um, if you have the ability to implement multi-factor authentication, so that's where I'm sure most of y'all are familiar that, with that. If you go to um, one of the, um, you know, social networking sites or even one of the other companies, um, you can set it to where you're going to get a second code. So that's going to help. Um, using complex, unique passwords or passphrases and having them different across all of your different accounts, that can also help. Um, and then also, you know, talking to your users. Um, if you have multiple users, making sure that they're kind of following the same procedures, that's really going to help. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a, it's a money-driven business, so the bad guy doesn't have to go you know, break into a bank or break into a convenience store to get the money. So if they can get access to your systems and encrypt them, they're going to demand a ransom. And, you know, we always recommend not paying the ransom because they, they don't necessarily give you access. If they do, they can come back and attack you again. Um, and, and quite frankly, we feel like that it, it, it encourages, encourages them to perpetrate more attacks and it funds their operations. Now, I can't say, I mean, there's obviously some situations I think you guys might have seen in the media where there's hospitals, life and limbs, things of that nature. Everyone has to make a business decision at the end of the day. But um, as I said, if you have an effective incident response plan and you're working with your providers, meaning like where you have your data, is it in the cloud, where your websites, who's your internet service provider, you might not have to pay that rent or feel like that you would even have to. You can just kind of recover. So just some things to think about before. Um, you could potentially be impacted by ransomware. Um, actually, uh, two, I think two weeks ago, uh, we had a presentation about the uh, security of uh, the food supply chain. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Ben E. Keith, uh, the distributor of food. Um, it seems that they had that issue with uh, ransomware, and they had uh, to actually hack the system. But the thing is that, as you can see in the food supply chain, we have a lot of stake stakeholders. And so if, let's say, the system of one party is just um, how to say blocked, I would say it's going to actually have an effect on the rest and eventually uh, some restaurants were, were not able to um, get uh, uh, the products that they needed, etc. And so what needs to be uh, done here also is that, for example, um, you could think about backup, backup data. Uh, uh, because as uh, Mr. Wilson mentioned here, uh, it's if let's say you don't have let's say a, a backup data, whenever the hackers are getting access to your data and they encrypt it, you can't, you you cannot get access to it anymore, and they will tell you to pay. Uh, that's the reason it's called ransomware. But then in that sense, if let's say you don't have any backup, 
you might have to pay maybe. But if let's say you have a backup, uh, backup data that actually you uh, store somewhere else, not on your system, but somewhere else, then you can use that and uh, then tell them, okay, just whatever you want anyway, it's encrypted. And sometimes what happens is that is that some you can have it could be let's say encrypted but they won't be able to get access to that data but also they could also get access to that data also so for that reason if let's say it's in the option uh, uh, let's say the side where uh, they cannot even access the data but they encrypted it's not a problem as long as you have a backup you know but if let's say they accessed it uh, they encrypted it but still are able to read what is inside, then it's a problem, you know. And so that's one thing, back up your data. There is also network segment, uh, segmentation. Basically, you have your network, uh, instead of having all your processes on the same network, you're going to divide that into multiple parts. And so if, let's say, there is an intrusion, and sometimes you will use what they call an intrusion detection system, you will use um, this type of system to pinpoint if, let's say, there is something coming to your system. If there is something strange that is coming, then it stops there, you know, and it's going to, you are going to be able to uh, kind of stop the bleeding at that level so that it doesn't spread toward the whole uh, network. So that reason there is, uh, you know, network set segmentation. Um, uh, there is also the entire malware software, routine patching also. Uh, it's really important also to make sure to update uh, uh, your, uh, whenever there is, um, there is the need of updating uh, your system. It's really important to do that and not procrastinate and say, okay, I'm just going to wait and then do it later. Because maybe you are the end point where this, the, uh, the whole company is going to be in jeopardy because you didn't actually uh, made um, uh, the update when it was needed. So this is what I wanted to add. Uh, just real quick. Um, in, in addition to what they all say, or what they've covered here, um, just think about what ransomware is. They're either going to take your data and just pull it out, so it's a mass exfiltration of your data, wherever it is, or it's an encryption, and then a lockdown and possibly a mass exfiltration. So just think that you need to know where your data is at all times. You need to protect your data. But I'll tell you this also, uh, big organizations like Wells Fargo, USAA, Bank of America, currently right now they're doing air gap solutions. So that's what they're starting to implement. Um, so you guys aren't really behind the ball at this point because some of the big companies are just starting to learn how to do this. But at a small level organization, you can do the same thing. And an air gap solution is simply you remove all connectivity to your data. So if you can imagine in your organization, you're backing your data up somewhere and it's encrypted, right? and all of your data and all of your endpoints are secured by Microsoft Defender or CrowdStrike or something. What you do is you take that data and once a month you back it up to an air gap solution. So it's a server or something where you physically remove the network cable so that you, so even an attacker can't get to it. Then on that device where you have that secondary backup, you have another solution like a carbon black or a secure work, some sort of endpoint protection that isn't on the rest of yours, so it has a double scan effect, so you're making sure that whatever you're backing up, if it wasn't caught with your normal solution, it's caught with a second solution, and even if the attacker does compromise anything in your environment, they physically can't even get to that server because you only physically connect it once a month to back up your data, and then you unplug it again. That is in theory, but on a much larger and more expensive scale, what Bank of America and Wells Fargo and those companies are doing right now. You can do it at a fraction of the cost of what they're doing it. It just takes a little manual effort. So in addition to everything that they've covered here, just think about how the attackers are getting your data, where it's stored, and work with your employees to make sure they're not storing PII and HIPAA-related information on their workstations. Make sure it's somewhere central, it's backed up, and it can go to an air gap solution that's cost effective. That's pretty much it. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, glad, glad you covered that. And kind of back to 
um, the backup solutions, offline backups, and we were, we're talking. You were talking about data exfiltration. So, um, we have a couple analysts monitoring the dark web, and so with some of the um, Royal and Lockpick, some of the newer um, ransomware and threat actor groups, one of the tactics we're seeing, and why you know we typically recommend not paying the ransom, is he's right. They can encrypt your data, and they'll give you the key back, but then it's kind of double extortion. So they may have already exfiltrated your data. So you pay. They give you the key, you're back online, and they're like, we're going to post, you know, whether it's internal emails or customer data or whatever, stuff that you don't want online. So then they come back and they try and get the money again. So just something to think about um, when you're looking at, you know, offline backups and uh, EDR is what it's called, endpoint detection and response solutions to protect your endpoints. Uh, as small business owners, uh, oftentimes you can choose to bring somebody in-house, hire an employee to handle this for you. Or, or outsource it, um, what attributes should small business owners look for, whether they're hiring somebody internally or they're trying to make the decision to outsource? Um, John, what, what kind of attributes should they look for when making that decision or, or specialties? Was it him? I mean, um, in my previous roles, I've looked for a few things. Um, I'm always looking for the reputation of the business. So if I'm bringing somebody in, um, whether it's a person or whether it's a company to do this for me, then I want to know that that company and that person have worked in environments that they're the same size and the same organization, the same um, domain, I guess you would call it, that I'm in. I want to make sure they're familiar with the requirements of my type of business, whether it's medical related or healthcare or, I'm sorry, medical or uh, insurance or any of those type of areas, right? That's one of the things I'm looking for. If I'm bringing that person in-house, which I usually try not to, it's usually more cost-effective to outsource this kind of work, in my experience anyway. Um, I'm looking for somebody who has done this before, can give me um, references that I can contact to see what kind of quality of work they do. Uh, same thing goes with hiring somebody inside. I'm looking for the certifications. I'm really looking for the experience. Uh, and I'm, sometimes I'll even bring in a trusted third-party company that I work with day in the day out for my endpoint protection or my server or network to sit in on those interviews, whether it's an outsourced company or internal, to get a feel for whether that person is blowing smoke or whether they really know what's going on. Because uh, you'll see both in this industry. You'll see people who have all the certs that have never walked a day in their life, and you'll see the people who know exactly what they're doing because they've walked it every single day. Um, so you can look for the search and the experience. You can bring in trusted advisors to help you along the way. But you want to check their references and check to see that they've done work in your sector. Great. And then, Jeremy, what resources are available to small and medium-sized businesses? Um, where can they go to get started or, or get some guidance? Yeah, um, great question. I know... Um, you mentioned several of the federal resources, and that's all out there. Uh, obviously, you can do web searches. Um, and I saw a lot of people raise their hands. They were familiar with DIR. I don't know if everyone's familiar with the Texas ISAL. That's the Information Sharing and Analysis Organization. So this is a private-public partnership. We have uh, roughly over 2,000 members. So everyone in this room can go to uh, the Texas ISAL, and that's on our webpage, dir.texas.gov. And that's a way to get free threat intelligence. So if we see something targeting Texas businesses or government or any of the sectors, we send out threat intelligence. And we get a lot of threat intelligence from the federal agencies, FBI, um, Department of Homeland Security, CISA, um, kind of all the federal agencies. And we work with a lot of uh, industry partners to make sure that we're not spamming you. We're putting out good stuff. So that's a free resource I wanted to mention. And if you see something, you, know, you could be the first one that sees a new ransomware group or a phishing attack. Uh, something of that nature, you can report it and know that we're going to share it out across all of our membership. Um, and, and again, uh, a lot of the stuff uh, that we do in my agency, as I said, is focused more on state agencies and cities and counties and governments. But with the ISAL, you know, we've been trying to produce products that are kind of more for the general public. So I just wanted to mention that there's some free resources that everyone right now can take advantage of if you're not already. Thanks. Fantastic. Do either of the other of you have? Sounds good. That's good? Okay, great, great. Um, hopefully we haven't scared y'all too much. <laughs> um, this is a, it is a scary topic. Folks are, are working to penetrate businesses and, and people's information every day, so it, it is something to be uh, concerned about. The good news is there are a lot of resources. There are a lot of companies out there that um, can help with this as well. If you're a small business and don't have the internal expertise to deal with it, 
So, and like you said, there's, there's several of them out here. Uh, we have booths and, and so forth, so please stop by and talk to those folks. Um, are there any questions in the audience? We would love to take audience-specific questions. Mm -hmm. for, a, for a small business that potentially wants to contract with, let's just say, DOD, federal government, um, word on the street is that over the next few years, there's going to there's gonna be a requirement, kind of a framework, yep. that it's going to be contractually obligated for, for a business to you know, demonstrate that this set of frameworks, even do, the, do this business with the federal government, I could foresee that going to the state, maybe even to you know, local government. Do you foresee that as real, and how is that going to affect the kind of people? Yeah. It's a great question. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's a really great question. So as you guys know, the legislature's in session now. Um, and so there's obviously, every time there's session, there's new bills. I know they're looking at cybersecurity insurance. Um, you guys might not be uh, familiar, but with the last legislative session, Senate Bill 475 gave our agency the authority to do what we call text ramp. So we're going out and uh, evaluating different cloud providers that do business with the state and they have to go through a certification. Um, I mentioned our website, there's a bunch of great resources there. So we have the Texas Cybersecurity Framework, which is based on NIST, the uh, federal agency that um, Dr. Kofi mentioned. So, um, you know, if you have to go and go through like a FedRAMP certification or something of that nature, there's, there's procedures there, but if it ends up being the legislature mandates something like that for the state of Texas, there's some things right now you can get familiar with so you're not kind of, you know, behind the eight ball, if you know what I mean. So, um, yeah, take a look at that, and uh, great question. Does anybody else have a question? Hmm? All right. What is a, uh, it's a pretty general but basic question, what is a sure sign tell that you can hack or even your identity and get stolen as a small business owner? Hmm. I, I don't think there's a, a sure sign. Sometimes, um, sometimes they will stay hidden for months. You won't know they're there. Um, they're not going to give you a, hey, I got you kind of thing until they're ready to collect payment, and then they're usually going to provide evidence. Um, sometimes they will give you a sign from a small business perspective. They'll give you a sign. Um, your users may report that things aren't working exactly right. They may have gotten a pop-up on their screen, something that just didn't seem right. That's subtle, right? That's typically what you will see until the attacker is ready for you to see what they want to see. If you are a more mature organization and you have an EDR solution and you have a, a outsource SOC or an inside SOC that, that is watching all of your logs, you'll start to see some of those things way in advance because a lot of attack groups will follow a pre-scripted, um, I don't know, step-by-step -step process, right? And they do these things in order, and places like Mandiant and CrowdStrike and SecureWorks and all these different soft providers and threat intelligence providers, they know what that is. So if you are a more mature environment, they will see those things and tell you, even if your users are not aware. But a lot of times when a small business doesn't have that type of infrastructure put in, um, it's really just a wait and see kind of game for them to tell you that they're inside of your network. Um, there's usually not any real obvious telltale signs um, unless they're just not good at what they're doing, but really. I mean, if it's a nation state, you're not gonna know for months. My last job, we had a nation state inside of it, or inside of our environment for four months, and we had no idea. And we had millions of dollars to spend on cybersecurity. So, yeah, it, there's no real telltale sign, but just encourage your users to report anything suspicious, and that's probably the best you could do at this point, unless you want to invest more money in the types of platforms that will help you detect it early. What can a small business owner do immediately for prevention? Um, Texas Cybersecurity Framework, work with that guy and his agency. They'll tell you, uh, they'll, they'll provide you with the free resources to walk your employees through things that you should do internally that are free, um, as well as some things you may want to look at that cost money. But there are a lot of things that if you follow his recommendations and the, and the state agency's recommendations, you can do that. If you are going to bid on federal contracts and you're talking CMMC kind of stuff, then that's a whole nother ball game and, and you can research the CMMC level one, two, and three, which used to be one, three, and five. 
um, you can follow those and, and they tell you exactly what they expect as well. And there's organizations that can come down and do that or you can do a self-assessment as well. But a lot of the free resources that he referenced are a great starting point along with bringing in manufacturers to help you understand maybe where your gaps are. And they do that for free as well. You can always to reach out to the businesses, the medium and small businesses in the community that, that work in that field that can come in and help you set up a plan or a plan of action going forward, for sure. Okay, there was a question over here. There you go. We talked earlier about uh, new technology, AI, chat GPT, uh, with the new technology that's coming, what are some of the potential risks that you might foresee? Um, yeah. Uh, ChatGPT is uh, very interesting. You know, I know personally. I just kind of been playing with it. Uh, you know, doing some different things. Um, it's quite powerful. Um, so for the hackers out there, you know, it can help with coding and actually script attacks. So you know, I think we're kind of on the cusp of of seeing how it's really going to impact the cybersecurity industry, um, where you know, just kind of like you're seeing where it. it can help people write scripts and do legal things and all that kind of stuff. It can help the bad guys too. So um, that's not to say that you know it won't be used by some of the companies that uh, my fellow panelists mentioned. But I think we're we're kind of we're in like a groundbreaking time where you know it, it, it's not fully known what all the impacts are going to be. Um, so you know it's it's that much more incumbent that we're kind of doing the basics, the blocking and tackling. I know we talked about how to protect yourself, and we talked about a lot of free things. So you know, patching, making sure you have strong passwords. Um, I talked a little bit about an incident response plan. Um, we find a lot of times when we go to organizations, uh, sometimes, a lot of times, they don't have an effective asset inventory, meaning they don't know where all their accounts are, they don't know where all their data is, they don't know where all their systems are. So making sure you're doing the blocking and tackling is the best things you can do while there's, um, as he mentioned, the nation states and some of the other uh, kind of lower level attackers are looking to use these tools to be more effective and cast a wider net. Okay, one more. There's one more out there. Okay, I think we're all good. Thank you. Thank you so much to the panel for their great information and great insight into this really vast area. So thank you and thank you for your great questions. <laughs>